Greetings, ladies and metalgens, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This story is called The Bipeds Are Insane, written by Composed Anarchy. The galactic community had been established for eons for so long that the vast majority of races had lost the count of where their whole world is. My race, the Kalani, were one of these. We were a proud warrior race of the vast territory bestowed onto us by the Holy Father Hakina via our divine providence for glory and conquest. For thousands of years, the holy light of Hakina smiled upon our warriors as we laid claim and conquered system after system, striking down entire empires as we saw fit. This is life in the scene of the galactic core. Civilizations have been clashing and borders shifting back and forth for longer than any one race can trace back their records. None of these records can even make account of the last time that a sentient species was encountered amongst the stars for the first time. It is well established by academics of every spacefaring civilization that all races with the capacity to become spacefaring in the galaxy have done so, and that those races emerged somewhere in the galactic core. The outer realm of the galaxy is nothing but a backwater. Areas are absent of intelligent life and of little material use. At least, so we thought. Then, one day, after making a significant improvement to our FTL technology, my race found itself in need of a rare elemental resource in order to deploy this new technology on a grand scale within our fleets. So we set about delving through the records of our systems and their resource surface to see where we could set up mining operations and refinement installations. Nothing came up, so we searched through the survey records of worlds belonging to other civilizations in the galactic core. We grew excited for the opportunity of another glorious crusade, but still nothing. We turned our attention to the outer areas of the galaxy sending out long-range survey scans from our capital world, and we found just the planet that we needed rich in this new elemental resource. A small red planet falls in the orbital succession of its yellow, stable local star. Hoping to discover more opportunities to collect the element, we scanned the other planets in the system. Then, something peculiar happened. Upon scanning the third planet in the system, something detected our survey scan pulse and sent a signal back. After some long-range communications back and forth after the next few decades, we realized that this Earth and the bipedal humans that inhabited it were barely to be considered intelligent. Their pitiful civilization had only managed to colonize several planets and moons in their home system and those of the two closest star systems. Pathetic! The labels of intelligent and spacefaring were a compliment to such lowly beings. So we sent a final communication informing the humans that we were coming. A divine crusade with the blessings of the Holy Hakino to drive the force behind our claws would be wrought upon them. We sent a small advance force to the Sol system to glass this ugh, earth. That was all that would surely be needed to smite down these humans and make them surrender and throw themselves to the mercy of Hakino to have the honor of serving as our slaves. And indeed, that was how easy it was. The advance force arrived and the events that followed were without anomaly, save for the fact that they noticed that Earth had one moon, not two as our early scans had indicated. They decided that we simply an error in the system scans. They should have looked into the matter further. Now, glorious warriors had no challenge in rending the Earth's defensive fleet from the stars. They glassed the planet with the holy wrath of Akina himself and returned to us triumphant. An occupying force was sent back out with a mining convoy to accept the assured surrender of humanity, and to set up a mining operation of the little red planet. But when the fleet entered the Sol system, they were met with a new 
human fleet. Their numbers and weapons dwarfed that of the original advanced force. In an instant, our ships were swatted out of existence. We should have known better. We should have studied these humans more. We should have known what wrath could be stirred up when a species' home planet was destroyed. What righteous and a terrifying wrath. We prepared ourselves for yet another war to pile onto the archives. What glory we would gain in the eyes of Aquino for slaying yet another inferior empire. We readied ships and soldiers, expecting a grand series of battles taking place across scores of systems. How little we understood. I can still recall it vividly to this day. I was standing at my console on the bridge of my fleet's flagship in orbit of Kalani Capital World. We had been running simulations to prepare for the coming battles with the humans. All of a sudden, the ship sent a set of alarms, signifying an incoming enemy FTL. I barked at my technical officer to give me a report of the readout. I... I don't understand, sir, he said. What is a crewman? Tell me now, I commanded. These readings... It can't be a ship, sir. It is the size of a planetoid, he responded, quivering. I pushed the crewman away from his console. You shame yourself before Hakino! How is it that you came to become a technician officer? If you can't read a scanner report correctly, I yelled. Then I read the readout of myself. It, it was accurate and would drop out of FTL in three seconds. I looked about the console and out the windows of the bridge to see a leviathan of a battleship drop out of FTL with a force so immense that the quantum backdrop alone sent out a wave of energy that disabled every vessel in the fleet in an instant. It was larger than our own planet's moon. The quantum backdraft that even our largest dreadnought class vessel released from FTL was only enough to induce a mild interference in comms networks. In a terrifying moment of sheer power, the Leviathan sent out a single message before it fired its main weapon and turned our glorious capital world into nothing but a few boulders of dust. For Earth, the next few months would spell the end of our dominion, and as much as we could prepare our battle lines, shield our ships, and reinforce our planets with defenses. The outcome was the same. The Leviathan Moon jumped to every world in our borders, disabling entire fleets just by appearing from FTL, and erased the planets from the cosmos. The Earth did have two moons after all, but as it turns out, one of them was a vessel of unimaginable scale. One of them was constructed by an insane species that had feared what would come at them from the stars just as much as they yearned to venture out into them. Once proud and mighty fleet command of Kalani was reduced to a wandering refugee. I now send this message to every empire in the galactic core. Be afraid of what horrors lie in wait in your galactic backyards. And do not piss off the humans or they will build a metal pallet and throw it at you. End of story. Story number two. Johnny, I hardly knew you, written by the cursor as it moved. New Lisbon was very much like the other planets in the Republic of Terror and her aligned planets, meaning that it was very Earth-like. Well, to be fair, the weather was far more predictable and precipitation was far more evenly distributed across the land masses, and the temperature extremes were far more temperate. Snow was exceedingly rare outside the polar regions, which made it somehow close to a paradise for farmers and ranchers. Even with this comparative mildness, Zeno's visitors were exceedingly rare. The main problem was the gravity, which was close enough to terrors that the difference was negligible for almost every purpose. Having gravity that would literally crush your visitors to death is something of a deterrent. Even if PGDs were wildly available and really not that uncomfortable, well, 
to be fair. The Xeno-made ones tended to make one's molars itch, if one had molars. The two notable exceptions were the Star Sailors, humanity's first and most stalwart allies, and the Lutre, who were also heavy wolvers. In the case of the Sailors or the Blave Vusas, or Blues as humanity calls them, amongst other more flattering nicknames, they visited for connections made with humans, and were perfectly comfortable with the Republican-made personal gravity devices. Whereas the Lutre, or Arties, or Water Noodles, as the small semi-aquatic people were called by the hosts, visited New Lisbon for two reasons, the fishing and the attention from humans. This all had very little bearing on the Nancy Blair as she clipped herbs in her garden, except that there was a party of one each and what was either a digiton in a humanoid walking frame or a cyborg opening her garden gate without so much as a hello. Nancy was about to scold them something fiercely, but she stopped when she saw that all three of them were wearing Republican naval infantry dress blues. Her throat ceased, tears welled up in her eyes, and the shears clattered to the cobbles of her garden path as she watched them march inexorably closer. When Nancy could see the scanned flesh remaining on what was now clearly a human cyborg, she called out, Did you bring me news of me, Johnny? Aye, he stands before you. The man answered with a tremor in his baritone voice. Oh, Johnny, where are your eyes that looked so mild? Where are your eyes so grey as the sea? Nancy asked as she took a nervous step towards the trio. They saw too much and not enough. The idiot took an acid blast to the face to protect me, said the Lutre with a lance corporal epaulets and a name Dirk on his right breast. Nancy's eyes flickered to his ribbon, and what she saw there convinced her that the diminutive man had the right to call Johnny an idiot. Besides, they were probably friends. The corpsman said the replacements have a higher degree of functionality. The final man, another lance corporal with an impressive ribbon block named Brextral, very helpfully said, As they say, I didn't see the trap until we were sprung, so it's my fault. I was trying to sound cool. Johnny said as he flashed a smile, and his cheeks, uh, what was left of them, blushed. This did little to comfort Nancy, who took another unsteady step towards the trio, asking just as unsteadily, Where are your legs? How can we run together now? A crooked grin split Johnny's mangled face as he answered, I can run and run all day long on these, and do any worry about the sideways shuffling. I asked them to make him so they aren't cold. Really, Sarge? To answer the question, Boris stepped on a mine. He's gone now. The three men all found flowers or cobbles to study. But to Nancy, the man's death paled in comparison to the suffering of her Johnny. Another step and she cried, You haven't your arms, you haven't your legs, you eyeless, noseless, a chickenless egg. Come now, I can get me a new face. I'm sporting in combat implants now, and uh, they say that there is enough on my skull to put me face back rightly. I just didn't want to leave you out of the design phase. You were meant to come home whole, Johnny. Johnny! I hardly knew you. She leapt into his arms, one biological and one cybernetic, and wept. I, I'm sorry, lass, I'm sorry. But I have my pay and me pension. Rosie can be proud of her da. She can be proud of me now. He pushed her away and sank down on his knees, saying, And now I am finally good enough. Will you take me marriage hand, Nancy Blair? The two Xeno guests who had come along for moral support were very nearly embarrassed themselves by leaping into action to protect their friend from Nancy's rather vigorous acceptance. Death Worlders, Dweck muttered, and he and his companion averted their eyes and turned about and began the long trudge back to the bed and breakfast deeper in the quaint little village. End of story. I would quickly like to thank our tier 5 patrons, Dragzoon WRE, Quantum Wednesday, Ambrose Catull, Lord Ashrakal, Bushmaster177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, and Arcadian. Thank you very much.